Hello, Kindred. The first thing you'll notice is that I'm nowhere to be seen, but that's okay because sometimes I just can't deal with myself on camera. Today is one of those days, but just because I don't want to deal with myself on camera is no reason we can't be hyped about awesome stuff and talk about the world around us. Today I'm going to talk about a new show which struck me to my core as a person and brought me to tears, and all in all had a dang impressive pilot episode. And that show is Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Roll intro! If you're not familiar with the premise of this show, the idea is due to a freak accident involving an earthquake, music, and an MRI machine, our protagonist is gifted with the power to hear people's innermost thoughts in the form of song. Being a musical theater nerd, I thought, hey, this sounds up my alley, and I gave it a shot. The first few minutes, I was unsure because of the tone. Then after the introduction of the family, I had a little more personal investment, but more than anything, I wanted to see how they handled the music. Because the one problem I have with a lot of musical themed shows is after a little bit, they seem to struggle with the same thing. The inability to understand how musicals actually work. See, there's this kind of tropey idea that musicals are when people randomly burst into song and dance. It's considered silly and ridiculous and frivolous. But that isn't the case at all. In that it isn't random at all. You see, a good musical could very much be equated to a modern piece of Shakespeare. Stick with me, I promise this won't get too pretentious. Though if I'm being honest, I don't find Shakespeare pretentious. He's pretty silly, including one of the first your mom burns in one of his bloodiest plays, dropping a C word in one of his otherwise cleanest plays, and look, the whole premise of a comedy of errors is a far-fetched, albeit enjoyable, piece of hooey. Where was I? Right. So in Shakespeare, you have two types of speech, prose and verse. Prose is pretty much the common tongue, whereas verse was often spoken by nobility to show that they were more hoity-toity and whatnot. This is where you get the whole iambic pentameter, which really just means words in a pattern of 10 syllables following unstressed and stressed syllables, like da-da, 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 or to put it in actual words, I do not have the monkey that you gave. You'll also notice that iambic is the same rhythm as your heartbeat. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Pretty simple. However, very often in Shakespeare, verse wasn't just something nobles did to show how much better they were than everyone else in those plays. It was also the speech of the impassioned. Even if a character regularly speaks in prose, the moment they start getting real heated about something or if they want to profess their love, into verse they go. This was Shakespeare's way of expressing an emotion that was so strong it took them to a higher plane verbally. When emotion is so high, regular speech is incapable of capturing it. This is also, with some exceptions, the rule that inspires good musical numbers. If you've ever been watching a musical and a number, while well-performed or even catchy, didn't feel quite right, it's probable because it wasn't emotionally earned. Look, for all its problems, and it had a lot of them, even if you ignore the whole why didn't we just make this about some fictional character rather than P.T. Barnum, I loved The Greatest Showman. The music is beautiful, it's bright, it's vibrant, it didn't feel ashamed to be a musical, which on film, for a while, leading up to it was a very rare thing. It didn't feel the need to ground itself in reality. It used the magic of film and movie making to enhance the idea of going to that higher plane rather than downplaying it with a realistic portrayal of the moment. Except a big problem with most of the numbers is they weren't actually earned. Rewrite the Stars is heartbreaking and beautiful and in theory is dealing with not only a relationship that has to cross class boundaries, but also racial ones in America in the 1800s. Not an easy task. But because we don't really see Anne and Philip's relationship, how it grew or even really how it started and how they came to care for each other, this number for all its beauty and metaphor and choreography and cinematography feels hollow. The build-up to this moment is truncated and cut off at the knees. It's almost as if there wasn't enough faith in the script itself that all the weight was put on the music. 
where in reality this relationship has to be one of give and take. If you're not going to go into full-on opera, those speaking moments have to be just as powerful as the music, otherwise that break from speaking to singing just will never feel justified. More than anything, this movie sort of felt like it wanted to rush through these moments of speaking just to get to the next musical number. Also, unrelated, but I'm angry that this line... And what is your act, Mr. Carlisle? I don't have an act. Hmm. Everyone's got an act. Was never revisited. I mean, how perfect of a storm offline for Anne would, I guess we found your act, have been? It would have been perfect, full circle, that's all I ask. I'm just saying, it's not important. But even with those songs, they are still half-earned, so to speak. You know, they, they almost went there, but they didn't quite get to it. But you still generally understand where it's coming from. And then there are other musicals where songs were written first and scripts were loosely written around them without much effort trying to tie them in. So they kind of just feel shoehorned and not really fitting. The Pajama Game comes to mind. But honestly, if you ever saw the later seasons of Glee where they just kind of stop the story to break into song and that song has nothing to do with the plot, doesn't push anything forward or reveal information about a character's inner thoughts, you'll know what I'm talking about. But to counterpoint this lack of build, an example that comes to mind of a good ramp up is actually from Wicked. After a visit with a wizard and things go, ooh, not well, don't want to spoil it if you've never seen it, Glinda and Elphaba essentially lock themselves in the attic on the run from the guards, which causes Glinda, who sees both of their futures ruined from this, to scold and escalate into a song so naturally, you almost miss where it starts. Couldn't you have stayed calm for once instead of flying off the handle? I hope you're happy. I hope you're happy now. I hope you're happy how you've This direct connection of music and emotion is a very powerful storytelling tool when used correctly. Otherwise, even if you enjoy the song, it kind of disconnects you from your immersion. This was my long-winded intro and explanation to why I'm excited about Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. Because the entire premise of her power is based around the idea of people's emotions being so strong and bubbling that they have to break into song. Every time a song came on in the pilot, it revealed something to us about characters, the plot, or generally something we didn't know yet. And it came from somewhere inside of them, something that had to get out. This show also seems to understand the importance of showing you only what you need to know. I don't have to see the entire song to get the idea across. I'm not going to detail the whole thing for you because honestly, I think it's worth a watch and you can see the entire pilot for free here on YouTube. There's a little thingy do I'm going to link in the description and flag it so you can check it out before it goes live next week? Next week, I think. Now, without giving too much away, Zoe's family has been struck with tragedy of her father falling ill with an unnamed rare plot devicey illness. And you know what? I'm totally okay with them not naming it. I don't care if it's a plot device, because this isn't a detail we actually need. This isn't a medical show. All I need to know is the impact that this illness is having on the family and on the man himself. This is a show about emotions, characters, and connections. Her father is in a somewhat seemingly catatonic state and has trouble eating and they aren't even sure if he's still neurologically able to understand them. He's disconnected from the rest of his family. For those of you who don't know, my father was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia and while it doesn't quite work like this and certainly not nearly this fast, this show hit so hard with these emotional beats. I've watched this pilot three times and every time I have cried. See, one of those ways that we still bond with my father is with music. The way our brains process music through neural pathways that have begun to establish even before we were born, picking up musical elements of speech or melodies themselves, creates a way for a kind of cognitive therapy through song. Research has shown us that music's been known to serve as a way to soothe affective disorders in four ways. The first is stabilizing emotion. 
It's thought that disorders such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder are often rooted in the dysfunction of limbic structures. Music holds the incredible capacity to modulate activity in these brain structures that influence emotion, and thus it can act as a natural, non-pharmaceutical relief for these disorders. I myself have a series of playlists on Spotify that I can just pop in my headphones and recenter myself. The second way it can help is in placating stress. Music's anxiety-reducing effect can also lower stress hormone levels such as cortisol, increase dopamine levels, trigger the brain to release endorphins, and even block pain pathways. Number three, it can preempt panic. Remember when we talked about how anxiety can affect us and the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems? Music can suppress the sympathetic nervous system, blocking an inappropriate sense of anxiety or panic or incorrectly triggering a fight or flight response. And the fourth is physiological relief. Music can not only stimulate psychological changes in mood, but it can also generate physiological changes in heart rate and breathing. Again, as we discussed when we were talking about anxiety, psychological will have a change in the physiological. And so much comes down to the breathing. And those are things that can help everyone, not just people with anxiety or depression. But you know what's even cooler? How music therapy is helping those with neurological or cognitive conditions. Research suggests that listening to or singing songs can provide emotional and behavioral benefits for people with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia. Musical memories are often preserved in Alzheimer's disease because key brain areas linked to musical memory are relatively undamaged by the disease. Maybe it's this deep connection with our memory and minds interlaced with emotion that music reaches us on a level that really no other medium can. Music's been found to not only trigger temporary memory relief, but longer term differences have been observed, including positive shifts in behavior, mood, and cognitive function in dementia patients. All of these signs can continue for hours and even days after they have been initiated by music. Aphasia is the loss or impairment of language, whether it be by speech or writing. My father is struggling through a kind of progressive aphasia, but those who've been through brain trauma may experience a form of it as well, such as those who've suffered from a stroke. However, it's been found that some people with aphasia can sing, but not speak, as the processing of song and speech occupy different parts of the brain. Melodic intonation therapy is particularly useful for aphasic patients as it converts speech into song through singing words in various pitches. In his book, Musicophilia, neurologist Oliver Sacks tells several stories about people with Tourette syndrome who, usually impacted by tics, were suddenly freed from compulsion upon playing music. Saying music in this way could be used to reconfigure brain activity and bring calm and focus. Even Parkinson's disease, which is marked by a long-term degenerative disorder affecting the motor system, has had research show that the organizing element of music can help support and even preserve functional mobility as it works to tackle the underlying neural mechanism of such disorders. It's these findings, this research, combined with Zoe's relationship with her father and how this show approaches music that makes me so intrigued is maybe the word. <laughs> now I can't be certain how I'm going to feel about this show after it finishes its first season. I can't even be sure how I'm going to feel about it after watching episode two. What I can tell you is this pilot excites me. It moves me. It seems to have a deep and empathetic understanding of song and how it can affect us both emotionally and psychologically. That music is above all about communication and connection and the power it can wield in that regard can transcend even some of our darkest moments and bring us hope. Music is an outlet. At its core nature, when understood, it's not random, it's not frivolous. It's an expression of a moment and a feeling an expression that takes the feeling so cloistered within ourselves we feel we might burst because our own language is ill-equipped to communicate them on its own. I think I love you. <laughs> Sorry, what? Oh, I think I love you, so what am I so afraid of? And that's music, that's song, that's dance, that's art.
and it has the ability to help us in ways we've only just begun to discover. How do you use music to help you in your daily life? Keep on the windy side of care, Kindred, and until next time, stay curious. What? <laughs>